Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So Team Grace, today we start Advent. This is the four Sunday season of penance and preparation. And this season should not be taken lightly, nor should it be lost or sacrificed to pre-Christmas preparations and celebrations. I know we live in a pluralistic society. I know that there are already a lot of Christmas things happening. Decorations are going up, Christmas trees are being decorated, Christmas cards are being swapped, Christmas functions are being held, and I realize that that's just a part of our culture. If we lived in a Catholic culture, we wouldn't do any of that until December 24th. When I was growing up in southern Germany, which is very Catholic, none of these things would happen until the 24th of December. It's not Christmas yet. You don't celebrate Christmas before Christmas. Instead, there was an observance of Advent. In our culture, which is very different, we have this other Christmas. Don't make no mistakes about it. There's this second Christmas that has nothing to do with Jesus Christ and wants to take all your attention. That's the culture we live in, and so I understand we have to be a part of that. But in the midst of all those things, do not lose sight that we are in Advent. This is a penitential season, a time of preparation. For we believers, Christmas is not until December 24th, and we wait, we prepare. So Advent is an important time to evaluate our lives, to evaluate our nation, to evaluate our church. It's a time to reform things and to bring them back to our first loves. St. John exhorts the early Christians, return to your first loves. We know that first time when we looked at the Lord Jesus and our own discipleship said, Lord, I will follow. I accept your love. I accept your way of life. I will follow you. John, St. John exhorts the Christians, return to that first love. That's a great Advent invitation as well. Return to your first love. In terms of the church, we see that the church also is in great need of rejuvenation and reform. There is much confusion and division in our church today. There is widespread dissension from biblical truth and moral goodness. Even some among us who would vote for a pro-abortion politician or who would support gay marriage or would decline the call to mercy and think that they are somehow good Christians. This confusion, this division exists within the church. Advent reminds us that the only true reform of our souls and of the church is holiness, to pursue and to love the Lord Jesus, to pursue holiness. Holiness is a total dependence, a reliance on the workings of God's grace to transform us and to make us fit for his kingdom. It's an openness of heart. Lord Jesus, come, give me your grace. Give me the strength to do all that you ask of me. Heal me from my sins. Strengthen me. Help me. This reliance on grace is the birth of holiness. But grace is also displayed in virtue. Virtue is nothing other than a good habit. It's something good that we decide to keep doing until it becomes second nature. That virtue, that good habit, that allows righteousness to triumph in our everyday life, in particular situations or state of affairs. We see that virtue is the manifestation of grace and holiness in our everyday lives, to tell the truth rather than lie, to show compassion rather than rash judgment. Every day in the twists and turns of life, we are invited to allow grace to shine through virtue, to exercise virtue. Now, all our human virtues are grounded on three theological virtues. These are the heart of what it means to be a Christian. In fact, you cannot be a good Christian unless you have these three virtues. I speak of faith, hope, and love. St. Paul sings about these virtues in his 13th chapter of his first letter to the Corinthians. Faith, hope, and love. These three virtues, they're theological. Theos is the word, the Greek word for God, because they deal with our relationship with God. I believe not in someone else, I believe in God. I have hope in God. I love God. Because they deal with God, they're called theological. They're also called supernatural. That is above the natural. Because these virtues of faith, hope, and love, they have natural equivalents. Let me give you an example. If I believe in God because someone told me about him, my parents taught me, or my priest preached about him, and that's the only reason why I believe in God, then that's a natural faith. Supernatural faith is when I believe in God because God has given a witness to himself. And I believe all that he has said, and all that he has done, and all that he has revealed as manifested by him who is truth, 
who can neither deceive nor be deceived. That's theological, that's supernatural faith. Now these three virtues are so important, these theological virtues, that we actually can't give them to ourselves. We do not have the strength to have these supernatural virtues. These three virtues are infused in us, shot like lasers right into our soul by the Holy Spirit at our baptism. Only the baptized have these infused virtues of theological faith, hope, and love. The unbaptized do not have them. They do not have the power. They are forced to approach God only through the natural order. But we, the children of God, the baptized, we have been given the supernatural virtues of faith, hope, and love. To not simply believe in God because I've heard about him or been told about him, but to believe in God because he himself has given witness to himself. And I believe that. These three theological virtues, they adapt and they change our fallen nature. They actually make us more like God and they empower us to participate in his very life. These three theological virtues also dispose us to obey God and to live according to the children of God, according to that vocation we have in God. Now, of these three theological virtues, they're so important and so essential that here at Our Lady of Grace during the season of Advent, we are going to talk about these three virtues because they're so essential to the Christian way of life. And I think it's important that we start with faith. As I mentioned, the virtue of faith allows us, the theological virtue of faith, allows us to accept God's own witness to himself. To say, God has given witness and testimony, therefore I accept it. We can say more broadly that theological faith is the virtue by which we believe in God because he has given witness to himself. God has spoken it, God has done it, God has revealed it, I believe it. That is theological faith. And we believe that because God is truth itself. Again, that who can neither deceive nor be deceived. Now, theological faith is very different from natural faith. I believe that one of the major problems we have in the church today is that the baptized approach God with only a natural faith. They have yet to truly radically encounter God in his innermost being and allow God to speak and witness to himself. And so many of the baptized only believe in God or only adhere to God or only follow God because they have been told about him. It's interesting in the book of Job, when Job puts God on trial, the entire book is seeking to answer the question, why do bad things happen to good people? And Job, for over 35 chapters, puts God on trial. And then God decides to speak. And after God has spoken and bore witness to himself, Job is humbled. And Job declares, in the past, my ears have heard of you, but now my eyes see you. And that is what theological faith desires to do within the baptized. To allow us not simply to hear of God, but to see him. To accept his own testimony. This is theological faith. Again, it's different from natural faith. And I believe that the problem is that a lot of Christians are approaching God with a natural faith. That's the first problem. But here's what happens. We are hardwired for theological faith as human beings, which means that we don't give God theological faith, supernatural faith, and we give God only natural faith, then we inevitably will give supernatural faith to other human beings. This is why so many marriages fail, especially among the young. This is why there's so much tension between neighbors, because we speak, keep expecting another fallen human being to live up to the standards of God, rather than realize that this person has fallen just like me. This person makes mistakes just like me. And it's only when we begin to realize, no matter how much this person loves me, or how much this person wants to care for me, they are fallen, they are going to fail, they will disappoint me. They cannot fulfill the demands of supernatural faith. Only God can do that. Which means we Christians have to turn this right side up. We give God alone supernatural faith. We give our neighbor natural faith, especially those of goodwill. That's an appropriate ordering because only God can fulfill supernatural faith. Now faith, we know once we begin to exercise this faith and begin to live this supernatural faith, the saints and the mystics, they tell us, and those are the baptized who have lived this life, you know what I'm speaking. The mystics tell us and the saints tell us that when we exercise supernatural faith, we can share in heaven even while still on earth. We can glimpse heaven while still in this earth. When we've exercised virtue, when we have truly died to ourselves and given virtue to someone else, 
when we have truly believed and radically believed, no matter what doubts we have or what questions we have, but have believed, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Or when we have shown love when someone does not deserve it. Or when another has shown us love that we do not deserve. We see the face of God. We touch his face even in this life. We see glimpses of heaven. And those glimpses of heaven by theological faith, they're meant to inspire us with even greater zeal to live a life of faith so that one day we might see God in heaven. The entire task of theological faith is to give us the strength to persevere in faith so that one day we might see God face to face. Would it shock you, dear friends, if I were to tell you that in heaven, there's no faith. There's no faith in heaven. It's not necessary. Because in heaven, we see God face to face. Faith, if we have arrived in heaven, faith has fulfilled its mission. Its task is to help us to persevere. Years ago, a gentleman approached me and said, you know, Father, I used to have faith, and then life beat the stuffing out of me, and now I don't have faith anymore. I was like, just go away. You sound so enlightened, but you're a fool. Just go away. Because, dear friends, faith is only faith when life has beaten the stuffing out of you, and yet you still believe. Faith is only truly faith when it's the only thing you have. When in the midst of all the brokenness and the fallenness and the hurts and the harms of this life, you endure them all and still declare, I believe. I believe in God. Even as you might have to say, Lord, I do believe. Help my unbelief. That's theological faith. That is a supernatural faith that is above the natural. It's above the things of this world. And it helps us to see God, to believe in him, and one day to see his face. But faith, we know when we live faith, it's not sufficient by itself. Eventually faith begs hope. And eventually faith and hope, they beg love. And eventually we realize that faith without works is dead. A person who says they have faith but they do not do the works of faith is a liar. Because when we have faith and we have hope and then we have love we want to do the works of God. And the works of God are mercy and compassion. It's seeking out the most forgotten or abandoned. It's doing the very work of God himself. And that's theological love. We're going to talk more about that this Advent season. But faith will compel us to hope and faith and hope to love. And we see that these three virtues of faith, hope, and love are necessary in order to fulfill our vocation as the children of God, in order to truly live as his children. So during this Advent season, I encourage you to fan into flame that theological faith in your soul, that faith that has been infused in you by the power of the Holy Spirit, to acknowledge that God is truth, that he cannot deceive nor be deceived, and to declare that you believe because of God's testimony in himself, his own witness to himself. Break away from the natural faith in God. You are the children of God, well beloved by him, and he has given you this power. I encourage you to exercise it. In this Advent season, fan it into flame as you, have never, as you never have before, and allow faith to become a reality, to change your life to redirect you towards heaven and to allow you to truly have zeal and a love for the things of God. This is our task. Now you see why these virtues are so important and why it's also important that we talk about them, that you realize what you have received and how you are called to live. As we celebrate this Eucharist, I pray that God instill in our hearts a deeper faith, that we all acknowledge what we have received and that we all take great action in the next week and throughout the season to live not by faith, but by theological faith, to see the face of God in your own lives, to see it here on this earth, and to desire one day to see it face to face. I ask that grace upon all of us, and I encourage you to celebrate this Eucharist and ask for that grace in your life, in your hearts, in your homes, so that one day God can say, faith has fulfilled its mission, and welcome you into paradise where you will see him face to face.